your emergency contact who should be notified in the case of death. Welcome to the USP. But before I get on with my story, I just want to show you guys a little bit of what I've been working on. This is my tattoo shop over here. Um, we're going to have a place for our clothing, but you know, this is just, we're going to have hooks up here and we're going to bring all of our stuff over here, load it up. And as you can see, we got the chairs over here. Yeah, everything's a mess, but March 9th, we're going to be opening it up, so we got all this up right here, everything right here. This is a four space right here, uh, four seats over here, then we got a space for four more, you know, so <clears throat> yeah, we're trying to do it, man, you know, I've been out 18 months, and we're just grinding away, but you know, like all this stuff out here, none of it would be possible without my wife and the people around me that believes in our vision and what we're trying to do out here. The people that we're hiring here, it's going to be dudes that have been in prison, dudes that are being just re recently released, you know, that want to make a career in tattoo shops because they can't get themselves into um, other spaces. So we're here to help. And yeah, just like my last video, man, I just, it's about, you know, bringing our community together. I know we all grew up from different sides of the streets, different groups, different gangs and all that shit, but we need to find a way to evolve from that and understand that, again, like, we're not the enemy. We're all brothers and sisters in the same struggle. That being said, Let's get on with the USP story. Now, there's been some crazy stuff that I've seen in a penitentiary. And this one is gonna be hard to believe if you didn't really see it with your own eyes, right? So all the homies that's been locked up with me that was in Atwater from 2008 to about 2011, man, hit up the comments. And let these people know that this dude really exists, right? Because, like, again, it's just going to be something kind of unbelievable. I didn't believe it when I heard about it because I was in the shoe at the time. So I'm in the shoe, right? I'm in there for, uh, I got to uh, Atwater about March of 2008. Around December of that year, 2008. I get locked up. Uh, the homies in around July, they uh, two homies uh, killed the police, killed the guard over there. And I've shared that story with you guys. So we were locked down for a couple months during that time. And then right after that, the blacks in 2B, really the Crips, but when the Crips got involved, all the blacks got involved, they got into with the white dudes over there because of... Uh, the TV situation. When they came off a of lockdown in 2B, after the, uh, we were only locked down for like two or three months for the, when they killed the, po when they killed the police. So when they came off a of lockdown, the COs had come and rearranged certain people's uh, tables and TVs and stuff, right? So, you know, in California Yard, there's an unwritten policy that the Crips and the Serenos be furthest away from each, from the unit, from each other. That's why I told you when I was in Lompoc, when I was in M Block, you know, the Serenos area was on the left side in the back corner, and then the unit is a horseshoe, and the Crip was on the right side in the back corner. You know, everywhere you go in California, when you see a Crips TV or a Sereno TV, tables and stuff, they're always from the furthest distance from each other. So when we come off a of lockdown for the killing, one of the Crip homie, they call him Little Man, he was out of LA. He approached one of the white boys and he's like, hey man, um, what do you think about switching tables with us? Cause you know, their table was right next to, the Crip table was right next to the Sereno. And the white boy's table was on the far end of the unit. And the dude was like, you know, long story short, he kind of blew him off like, yeah, whatever. It don't matter, you know, this is our table. We ain't, you know, he wasn't trying to have that conversation. 
So the next day when they came off, when they came at from work at 3.30, 3 o'clock, I recall the blacks took off on them. You know, the Crips took off on them, but with the Crips, the Bay Area and all the other blacks got involved and they pretty much punished the white dude because the white dude was caught off guard. Like the dude that was speaking for their unit, the shot caller, he didn't even have enough sense to like put his people up on game about the conversation about what's going on. He was just like high and mighty and figured like ain't nobody gonna do nothing about these things. But people gotta understand when it comes to issues with the Serenos and the Crips out in California, it gets serious and it gets serious fast, right? So that little riot and that block jumped off. Boom, we go back on lockdown and we're locked down till about December. So when we come off in December, we're starting to get our hour out, you know, a couple hours out of our cell to shower, use the phone and all this. Well, I get picked up under an investigation for attempted introduction. So they swoop me up and shoot me to the shoe. And I stay in the shoe until about May. Right. You know, every time I go to the shoe, I get laid down for there's only been a few times where I went to the shoe and did like three weeks or a month. But most of the time I go to the shoe, I get put under investigation for whatever it is that they're trying to investigate me for. And um, I get laid down. But every time they put me under investigation, it's because they think I'm doing something. They feel like they know I'm doing something. They've heard that I'm doing some but they've never caught me with anything. I've never been caught with dope. You know, I've, got, I've been caught with knives because, you know, I've been in incidents where, you know, knives were used or whatever, but as far as like investigation, as, you know, introduction or running and gambling, this and that, I've never, I've never been caught with, with any of that stuff, right? So I'm sitting in the shoe and one day, I go out, I'm out in the yard. Cause I go, when I'm in the shoe, I go, I go to wreck every day, no matter if it's six o'clock in the morning or six o'clock at night or whenever, whenever they come and pull me out, I go out. For me, it's, it's just to get out of the cell, to get some fresh air, to walk around, but also catch the news about what's going on on the compound and chop it up with people. Cause you know, when you're in the cell, it's just you or maybe a celly and you gotta catch a break from each other. You know what I mean? You gotta catch a break from the cell and you gotta catch a break from your cell. So I'm out on the wreck cage and it was a dude uh, from Detroit. I was in Beaumont with him. I forget his name. It's been a long time, right? So he's in the cage next to me. And he's like, man, what's up, man? And he was just in my block. Him and uh, after I came to the shoe, I guess they got into it with somebody. I forget who they got into it with, but now he's in the shoe with me and we're out in the wreck cage together. And he's like, <clears throat> you know, the conversation I had with him was kind of like, you know, in the beginning, like, okay, I don't know how to explain it, but he's like, hey, oh yeah, you was in Beaumont, right? I was like, yeah, I was in Beaumont. And he was like, man, you remember Johnny? I was like, Johnny? I was like, yeah, I remember Johnny. Uh, which one, the one from, uh, from Carolina? Yeah, I think he's from North Carolina, right? And he's like, yeah, man, you know Johnny be swinging? I'm like, yeah, because, you know, when I was in Beaumont, this dude, Johnny, we used to play ball and stuff together, you know, tall, slim dude. And, well, he turned out to be, you know, a punk. He turned out to be gay, right? But uh, the dude from Detroit, he was like, yeah, remember Johnny? I was like, yeah, and he was trying to describe me. Man, that motherfucker had pretty eyes, huh? And I'm like, uh, you know, I never really looked at dude's eyes, right? So I'm just like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, all right. I, I hope this conversation is not going that way, right? But anyway, so dude's like, man, dude, you won't believe who just came into our block. I'm like, what, man, there's this Mexican dude that just came off the bus. They call him Donkey. I'm like, Donkey? He goes, yeah. He goes, nah, for real, donkey. He's like, I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, dude, the dude's got a third leg. 
Now he's saying a third leg, and he's like sticking his arm out. Like, yeah, dude's got like a third leg. But he's talking about that shit drag on the floor. He's like trying to describe it to me like, that shit's like this round, and that shit drag on the floor. And I'm just like, man, you know, that's just, it sounds like he's putting on a little too much on that shit, right? Like, the shit dragging on the floor. You know how people exaggerate or whatever. So anyway, around May or whatever, I end up getting out of the shoe. And I go into the block, 2A. So I go in there, and all the homies come up, they give me a care package and stuff, hook, hook me up with whatever I need to get, you know, get back into motion and stuff. And um, and I tell them, I was like, hey man, uh, remember old boy from Detroit? He's like, yeah. Man, he told me that there's a Mexican dude up here that they call Donkey. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, yeah, dude, yeah, Donkey, he's, he lives over there. I'm like, what? He goes, come on, come on. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to, he's like, man, just come on, come on, come on. So we go over to this motherfucker's sale, right, and he's got sweats on. He's got sweats on, and you can see the impression that shit is on the floor. Like, that shit look like it's about that that round, and it's dragging on the floor. And I'm like, what the fuck, right? <laughs> so so uh, the homie Billy, this dude, right, the homie Billy, I think I mentioned him in the other episode, Billy Leon, out from Provo. So me and him went in, in the block. He's like, hey, uh, donkey show. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to see that shit. He's like, I got your show. No, he's got it wrapped up. So this dude's got socks wrapped up around his junk, right? And I'm telling you, it's a third leg. So this dude pulls his shit out and puts it on his shoulder. He puts it out and flops it on his shoulder like this, right? And I was like, what the fuck? You know, like, oh, man, right? <laughs> anyway, so he got this shit on his shoulder, right? And he's like, and he's over there like this. Like, we're like, Oh man, that's just too much. Then this dude grabs it and just grabs it, and like the dude donkey, not anybody else, but donkey. He grabs it and freaking bites it, bites the tip of his. You know, it's all wrapped up in a sock, but bites it. We're like, oh hell no! Nah. And we all rolled out, right? We all rolled out. But um, yeah, like um, people were saying that he had like a tumor or something, and that's how his shit got like that. But um. So we go to uh so we go to Chow, right? So we go to Chow, you know, they call our unit for Chow or whatever. So when we go out and we're when we're coming back uh when we're coming back out, you see all the female staff is lined up. You know, I go to Chow, you know, when I first got there, I go to Chow and there might be a handful of female staff or whatever there, or whatever. But um I'm just like the numbers is is off to me because I don't ever see that many female staff in front of the chow hall over there patting us down, you know, checking if you're sneaking out some vegetables or whatever else, right? So when we come out of chow, the whole wall is lined up with female staff. And I'm like, damn, there's a lot of girls over here, right, today, you know? And uh, the homie's like, yeah, they're over here to freaking check out donkey, right? Because, you know, like there's no way... Like, he can't wear the khakis that, like, he's got to wear, like, a size 40 and shit for, uh, for his shit to be covered up. He can't wear, like, you know, skinny jeans. It ain't going to fit, right? Because <laughs> this dude really have a third leg. So, so he comes out, and uh, we're getting patted down. We're getting patted down, and he's, he's in front of me. So there's a CO that's patting him down, and they're patting him down checking his waist, going down his leg, and feels a bundle. And the CEO is like squeezing it like, hey, what is this? He's like, oh, that's me. And uh, the dude CEO, because I think that's what the female out there was was out there to uh, to like observe, like, because they already know that he, because he's already been there a few months while I was in the shoe. So now it's just like when these rookie comes on, I think all the CEO just goes and fucking like try to get one of these rookies to 
pat the dude down because they're always thinking, he, you know, when they see him, he can't hide it. So it looks like he's smuggling something out. So this this young CO, he's patting him down and he gets to his junk and he's squeezing it. And he's like, hey, what is this? He's like, oh, that's me. Like, oh, that's not you. What do you got? Some onions, some bell pepper. And he's squeezing it, right? Why he's squeezing it, we're all we're all laughing. We're busting up. We're like, this dude right here is stupid, right? So the, the so the bison is like, no, 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 that's 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 me. That's that's that's, that's me, that's me. He's like, man, hey, you man, let me see that shit. Pull that shit out. So the bison is looking around because you know there's females there, there's a bunch of other COs and administration and a bunch of inmates that is being held up because this fucking CO is trying to pat this dude down. But everybody in the hallway is is laughing. Is like looking at this CO and is like, man, <laughs> like, you know, because, you know, we know what it is. But this CO, he's like insistent, like, oh, let me let me see that. Let me see that. And the fight is like, you know, he's kind of embarrassed at the same time. But he's like, man, so he like, he un uh he undo his uh his sweats because he gotta wear sweats. The dude gotta wear sweats, right? So, and he and he just pulls his uh sweats out. He doesn't pull his junk out, but he just pushes his sweat out because he's got like a size forty sweats on. So he pulls his sweats out, and the CEO looks looks down his pants and he's like, oh, oh yeah, go 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 right go right. <clears throat> so. Yeah, it's just, um, <laughs> like, I wasn't really sure how to freaking uh, share this story without sounding kind of gay, right? <laughs> but uh, whatever, you know. But this is some of the crazy shit that you see in there. And um, so another time, we're locked down. And uh, they're coming down, shaking our unit. They're taking everything from us. They tell us, hey, pack everything up. You know, they pass out these uh, these military duffel bags. And whatever you, they give us two of them, boom, two military duffel bags. And you can only keep whatever you can fit in there. If, if you can't fit your property in there, they're taking it, they're throwing it away, or you can say, send it to your people. But nobody ever sends anything to their people because your people ain't gonna want your freaking prison shit. You know what I mean? Some old raggedy shoes and some sweats or whatever. So they come in, they pat, they had us out these freaking uh, military bags because something major just happened. And when something big happened on the yard, they like to come down and shake us down and take all of our shit. So at this particular time, they're coming through and they're saying, hey, no shoes, just shower shoes, just a T-shirt and boxes. You know, just a T-shirt and boxes. That's it. You can't wear your clothes. You can't, you know, because they're going to go pat you down. Make sure you don't got nothing hidden on you, nothing, you know, nothing strapped on you or anything like that. And all your property's got to fit in the duffel bag. So at this time, I, li I live in 101 in 2A in, uh, in Atwater. And that Paisa, he lives in, uh, at this time, he lives in 220-something, like maybe 224 or 222, right? But he gets moved around a lot because, you know it seems like every week, every few weeks, he has a different celly. And one of the bison that I talked to that used to be a celly, I'm like, damn, man, what's up, man? Why you kick the bison out, out of your cell? He goes, oh, man, ain't no room for all three of us, right? <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's like, man, I ain't trying to be in that cell with that thing, <laughs> right? So, you know, and then some bison that comes in, they got to be forced to take him as a celly. But eventually, you know, people don't want to live. You know, with that many with that many bodies in there, and they move him around to uh, different people. So, so he's in his cell by himself, right? He's in his cell by himself, and the COs are coming. They're shaking down. You know, they're pulling people out of the cell to uh, <clears throat> to pat them down and go through their property because we got to take our property. They bring in the freaking uh, X-ray machine. You know, where they they take your mattress, they fold your mattress up feed it through the x-ray machine, you know, to uh, x-ray your mattress. They put all your bag through the x-ray machine. You know, they're looking for knives. Mainly they're just looking for knives because somebody got stabbed up real bad on the yard or two groups crashed. And now they're just trying to, 
you know, find all the weapons and stuff. So they, so the CO come to our door. He's like, hey, man, just a duffel bag, T-shirt, and boxers. That's it, right? So me and my Sally, my Sally is Bryson. You know, we're like, oh, man, I know they're going to have fucking Donkey come out in those shorts, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we're watching them. They're going around to every window and to every door and telling everybody the same thing. Two duffel bags, shirt, and a boxer. That's it, t-shirt and a boxer. That's all you cut. And sandals, no shoes, or no socks. And so, so one of the COs, he goes over there to the, um, to the Pisces cell, which is across from me, to the right a little bit. And the Pisces knocks on the door and he said, hey man, uh, he saw, he said, hey, I, you know, he tell him, like, he knocks on the window, he's like, hey, uh, I can't wear, sh I can't wear boxers. And the CO, he's new. He's like, oh no, you have to wear boxers. You have to wear boxers, t-shirt, boxers. And the Pisces said, you know, you can, you can see him, like, he's shaking his head. He's like, you can't. And, uh, and uh, the CO, you know, he's trying to give the dude an attitude, like, like, why can't you wear boxers, right? So the Pisces like, He's, you can see him step back from the window, and you know the CO is on the window like this, you know, because our door, you have a slit, you know, a little, it's about maybe two feet high, and about maybe a half, half a foot wide, so two feet long and about half a foot wide. So the CO, you can see him look in, you know, and then he snapped his head back. He walks off. Goes down, goes grab the lieutenant or whatever, and then comes back and they're and they're having a conversation, whatever. And then, uh, but when they, you know, they pull us out, we they pull us out, take our property to the X-ray machine, put me in the uh, TV room. You know, they put everybody in the TV room. We're all cuffed up behind our backs, sitting in the TV room while they're shaking down the unit. So they go to a. Uh, and everybody's like snickering, like, oh, there goes the CO. They're going over to Donkey's door, right? So they go over Donkey's door, and um, they unlock his door. They pull him out, and he's got all his clothes on. He's got a fucking sweats and a big-ass T-shirt and a coat, <laughs> right? But, yeah, man, I don't know what happened to him. Like, um, he got out around maybe... 2010, 2011, but there was people that came back on a violation that were, uh, that had got deported, but they had came back for, uh, not violation, but a uh, re-entry, my bad. They came back for a re-entry, and some of them, the rumor was like, they've seen him out there in Mexico, that he was just homeless, living out in the field, eating off out of the trash and shit, you know, but... Yeah, that was one of the craziest things I've seen. Like, for me, like, like this dude could have made a lot of money over here if he just got with the right people into the right industry, you know what I mean? The adult industry, like, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, he's out there homeless out there in Mexico from last I heard. But that was one of the craziest shit, if not the craziest shit I've seen outside. That's what I see, you know. The shit that happened in Boma where the dude cut off his weenie, that was the craziest shit that has ever happened while I was there as far as, like, that type of stuff goes. But, yeah, man, through 20 years of uh, incarceration, you're bound to run into some wild shit. Welcome to the USP.